good. How's the audio? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good, good, very good. Jesus and his world, the archaeological evidence. Yes, there is very important archaeological evidence that supports what the Gospels say about Jesus. Sometimes people say, oh, the Gospels are these old books, and it's full of mythology, and that's a long time ago. Things have changed, science, you know, blah, blah, blah. We actually have ongoing archaeological work every single year in the land where Jesus lived and ministered, where the early church began, ongoing archaeological work that shows that the Gospels <clears throat> do tell the story accurately. When the Gospels say Jesus did certain things or this was the world he lived in, the Gospels have it right. Let me look at, let me show you a, a review, a preview of the topics. Did Jesus live in a Jewish world or a Greek world? Some have suggested that it actually was a very Greek world, that uh, Jesus held to some ideas like cynicism and so on. And if this is true, then our understanding of Jesus would be radically changed. So is it true? So we're going to talk about this city called Sepphoris, just four miles away from the village of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. <coughs> of course, Jesus preached in synagogues. He preached, he taught, he healed in synagogues. Gospels tell us this over and over again. He preached in all their synagogues, traveling about in Galilee. Well, someone has said there weren't any synagogues. That's anachronistic. Synagogues weren't built until after the year 70 when the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. Well, if that's true, then the Gospels have it terribly wrong. Can we trust the Gospels in anything if they have Jesus teaching in buildings that didn't even exist yet? Jesus and his disciples sometimes are in a fishing boat crossing the Sea of Galilee. His disciples, some of them were fishermen. They had boats. And he'd get in a boat with his disciples and go to the other side. But some skeptics said, oh, the boats were too small. Only four or five people. You couldn't have Jesus and 10 or 12 disciples in a boat. They weren't big enough. What does archaeology tell us? And this one I think you'll find very interesting. In the New Testament Gospels, Jesus is portrayed as a healer and exorcist. He can command the evil spirits to leave. Does archaeology shed any light on that topic. It does. And I think you're going to find that fascinating. So this is what we're going to look at this morning uh, in the time that we have. But let me begin by explaining something about archaeology. <clears throat> Archaeologists invest a lot of time and money in what they do, just the nature of the work. Now, see, as, you know, I was introduced, okay, you know, I have a PhD, okay, I could go up, oh, and I have a habilitation, okay, how about that? Uh, my, my sister, who's a lawyer, when I told her, hey, I'm habilitated, she goes, what comes next? Rehabilitation? <laughs> oh, I've heard all the jokes. When I was a seminary student, you know, I was studying Greek, and everybody's saying it's Greek to me. <laughs> anyway, I've heard all those jokes. All right. Anyway. Well, you know, you can have a PhD. And in fact, I tell people to really come up with a bad idea, to come up with really a goofy theory, you need a PhD. So that's just to let you know, okay? <laughs> Okay. You can have a PhD and you can go up into the proverbial ivory tower. I've been up in it. It's in Princeton, named after the ivory soap company who built it. Anyway, there's a real ivory tower. And you can go up into that ivory tower and you can dream up all kinds of theories. And the only thing at risk is your own time and maybe your reputation. But when an archaeologist asks 50 people and some digs, maybe 100 people, to donate two weeks or four weeks of their time at their expense, fly to Israel, stay in a hotel, pay some fees, volunteer digging. You've got two or three hundred thousand dollars wrapped up in this project. You are digging out two or three tons of earth each day. You better know what you're doing. Can you imagine recruiting 50 people? They fly to Israel, all that expense, all that sweat, all that work, and you dig up nothing? Oh, shoot, it was the wrong spot. Better luck next year. Who's going to come back next year? The archaeologists have a lot of the proverbial skin in the game. There's a lot of money. A lot of time, a lot of sweat. They don't want to make mistakes. They don't care what your theories are. They don't care what some guy up in an ivory tower is dreaming about. They deal with reality. And when they bring out these volunteers, 
and they're competing with other digs who want those same volunteers. In Israel, there's 100 digs every season, and it's usually most, mostly May through uh, August, so the dig season is just now ending. They're competing, and if you waste those volunteers' time, if it's a fool's errand, you'll never get them again. So you want to know where to dig, and of course you want to understand what you dig up. So you want to use the best sources. Now here, listen to this. Every archaeologist, whether he's Christian or Jewish or agnostic, has no religious affiliation at all. Every archaeologist interested in first century Israel, the time of Jesus in Israel, they use six sources. Always. One source is Josephus, the Jewish historian that talked about the Jewish rebellion, the war, 66 to 70, who writes the Jewish antiquities, talks about life in Israel in the first century. They all use Josephus, and the other five sources, they're all in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Book of Acts. All of them. Whether they believe in God or not, whether they're Jewish, Christian, or something else, they all use Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Do you know why? Because they find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts accurate. When they say a certain city is there, it's there. When they say a road went over here, it's there. When they say this is the custom or these people lived here and did these things, they did. And so they find the Gospels a reliable guide. Doesn't mean you have to be a Christian. They just find it a reliable guide. So they use the Gospels in doing their work. Too much is at stake. Too much money, too much time, too much energy, too much labor. You don't want to blow it. They want the Gospels because the Gospels help them say, this is a good spot to dig. And oh, by the way, when you dig it up, this is what it is. This is how you understand it. All right, let's jump into it. <clears throat> Sepphoris in context, the city of Sepphoris, a lot of you don't know that. You all hear about Nazareth. It's an existing village to this day and so on. Here's Nazareth. Jesus grew up two, three, four hundred people or so lived in Nazareth, we think, in the time of Jesus. But just four or five miles away is Sepphoris, a major Greco-Roman city, 25,000 people, something like that. Very Greco-Roman in, in its architecture, the way it looks. Lots of Greek, Greek inscriptions found right on the streets and so on in Sepphoris. So the theory has come along, well, maybe that was Jesus' world. When he's younger in his family, his father's a carpenter, really better understood as a builder. So Joseph and the boys are going to Sepphoris to work and so on in the teens and the 20s before Jesus breaks out in ministry. Well, he probably did work there. And there is Greco-Roman ar architecture, to be sure, and Greek and so on. But does that mean Jesus thought of himself more as a Greek philosopher, or did he see himself more as a Jewish teacher in the context of Israel? That's the question. So what does the evidence at Sepphoris show? Well, of course, we have a theater. It's been partially restored at the, at the, at the front, the, the closest part, but you see how rough it is as you go up. And when it was there in its fullness, it probably handled 2,000, maybe 2,500 people, okay? And uh, seating at a theater is usually 10% of the total population. So that's how, that helps us guesstimate the population of Sepphoris, about 20, 25,000 people or so. And so is this proof that it's a Hellenized you know, city? I mean, after all, we have a theater. And of course, you think of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, when he talks about hypocrites. And the word hypocrite is a Greek word. Hypocrite means a play actor. So he says, don't be like the play actors when it comes to practicing your faith, your piety. And he's talking about giving alms. He's talking about fasting. He's talking about prayer. And the play actors put on makeup so they, it's obvious they've been fasting. They want to show off their piety. Or they make a lot of noise, you know, and they throw a few coins into the offering at the temple. Clatter, 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 cling, cling, cling. And everybody, oh, wow, Moshe gave a big gift. You know, and they, oh, yeah, I, I'm generous. Or people in their long prayers, he says, don't be like the hypocrite who comes out with a trumpet, boop, 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 you know, and everybody, oh, wow, you know, here comes a big prayer. All of this alludes to the theater. And Jesus says they do that to be seen by people. To be seen is the same word from which we get theater. And people, he's talking about the audience. So yeah, there's a good argument to be made. Jesus probably 
he saw that theater. Maybe he even attended a play. I don't know. So he knows that. So it's not like Jesus grew up four miles away and had no idea the city was there. He knows it's there, probably lived there or worked there. Now, here's an interesting mosaic. This is on the floor of the dining room. And people would have their little couches surrounding it, and they could look at this beautiful artwork right there in the middle of the floor, and that's Hercules. And he's in a contest with Dionysus, and you could actually see the name Heracles in Greek there in the middle of that slide. And, he, and it's kind of like his muscle more powerful than wine, and guess what? It isn't. Wine wins out. Dionysus, the little effeminate god of wine, overpowers mighty Hercules. How about that? Okay. So this is as pagan as can be, and we have Greek words. And then at the other end of this mosaic, here's the, the matron, the mistress of the mansion. We call her the Mona Lisa of Galilee. So you look at that and think, wow, this is so pagan. Four miles away from Nazareth. Maybe Jesus did grow up in a Hellenistic world. And look, the paved street, the Cardo, goes right through the heart of the city. Paved with stones. I mean, what a Greco-Roman looking city. Little village of Nazareth, just four miles away. Maybe there was a Hellenistic Greek atmosphere here that influenced Jewish lads who lived in nearby villages. So the argument goes. But archaeology has worked away these last 30 years and have found all sorts of things. And these things that they have found do not support this hypothesis. Jesus really did not grow up in a Greek world. He grew up in a Jewish world even though we have Sepphoris nearby. So let's take a look at that evidence. Here it is. <clears throat> we have found no pig bones in the time of Jesus. We do the stratigraphy. We dig down to his time, not later times, his time. No pig bones. That's very significant. Pagans love pork. You need to know that, okay? You go anywhere in the pagan Greco-Roman world and getting a ham sandwich or bacon is no problem. In Israel, in Jewish villages, big problem. There's just no way you can walk up to Moshe's diner and say, I want ham and eggs. He, he, what? That is not going to happen. Are no pig bones. In other words, we found the dump. We have the what we call faunal remains, the bones of animals that have been butchered, cooked, eaten, and so on. And so what do we find? We find kosher bones only. No non-kosher bones, no pig bones, no pagan artifacts, no pagan buildings. What do we do find in Jesus' time? Dig down to his time. Jewish mikvaot. Those are baptistries. At the Hollister campus where I just came from, there, there was a baptism that got underway just as I left. There was a mikvah right there in the middle of the church, only it was round instead of square. We find square mikvaot. That's the plural of mikvah. Square ritual bathing pools. They all have little steps like this. You step down into the water. Little small ones in the basement of Jewish homes. They're everywhere. I've seen them. Pagans don't do that. The Jewish people do that. Fragments of stone vessels. Why stone vessels instead of clay pots? Ceramic. Because stone vessels resist contamination. Remember the Gospel of John, chapter 2? Jesus turns the water into wine, and he says, well, go over to the six wine jugs full of water for the custom of purification, the Jewish custom of purification. Those are wine jugs. You find, or not, uh, those stone water jugs. You find stone water jugs, and you know this is a Jewish place. You find fragments of the menorah, the seven-branch candelabra. That's Jewish. You find no pig bones. You find no pagan artifacts. You know, this is not a pagan city. It's a Jewish city. Sepphoris in the year, in the time of Jesus, in the 20s and the 30s, was thoroughly Jewish. And that's the point that we see. Je Jesus grew up and ministered in a Jewish world which took its faith seriously. It was a world of scripture, a world of synagogues. We'll come to that in a minute. A world of teaching and disciple making, a world of some Greco-Roman influence, but not Greco-Roman morals and religious ideas. Galilee was very Jewish. Now, see, this is a great example of how archaeology comes in. It doesn't prove some particular thing. It provides us with backdrop. It answers a very important question. Jesus grew up in what kind of world? He ministered in what kind of a world? This is hugely significant. And you look at the Gospels, and the Gospels say Jesus quoted Scripture, discussed Scripture, talked Jewish theology, Old Testament theology, all the time. 
It sure sounds like, if we read the Gospels, Jesus grew up in and ministered in a very Jewish, very Old Testament world. Well, the archaeologist says, yeah, that's correct. Even the big city next door to the village in which he grew up, even the big city was thoroughly Jewish as well. Okay, that is very significant on archaeology. Now, what about this next question? Were there synagogues in Israel? According to the Gospels, there were. 30 years ago, a few skeptical scholars asserted there were no synagogue buildings in the time of Jesus, meaning buildings dedicated for that purpose, buildings that if you were walking down the street of a village and you'd say, oh, that's the synagogue, you'd recognize it because it has a certain architectural typology. It looks a certain way. Like today, you're in a town, you go, oh, there's a church. And you say that before you see the word church. You saw a steeple and a cross. You'd be, That's a church. You recognize it. It has a look. Well, there were some who said there were no synagogue buildings till after the year 70 when the temple was destroyed. So were there synagogues? Are the gospels correct when they say Jesus taught in their synagogues? Or are the gospels anachronistic? That is, unhistorically reading a later time and reality back into the time of Jesus. So that's the question. Were there buildings that had that synagogue look and were used as places of worship Tuesday, Thursday afternoon, evenings, and all day Saturday, Shabbat, Sabbath? Were there or were there not? Now, I can illustrate it with the story of the Baptist who was lost at sea and got washed up on the shores of a remote island in the middle of the South Pacific. And he lived there for years all by himself. And several years later, rescuers came and they found him. And he's all oh, great. I've been rescued at last. And rescuers came ashore and said, OK, we'll take you home. But well, wait a minute. What's with all the buildings? They, they saw three buildings. And he says, well, that's my house. That's where I lived. Oh, OK. Well, what's that other building? It kind of looks like a church. Well, that, that's what it is. It's my church. See, they recognized the way it looked. But they said, but, but there's another one that looks just like it. Oh, he says, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> okay, so there was a typology. They could recognize it, right? See, he's a true Baptist. I, I don't go to that church anymore. I, I had to build a new one. That's, that's where I go. Yeah, okay. Oh, I get it. All right. Okay. So were there... Were there synagogues in the time of Jesus that looked like synagogues? And people say, oh, that's a synagogue. Yeah, there were. Today, 10 synagogues have been confirmed as being in existence in the time of Jesus and his disciples. 10 and counting. Two more are being looked at that perhaps will be added to this list. The Gospels are correct. Jesus did often and regularly speak and heal in synagogues. So here are some pictures of them. <clears throat> there, there's, oh, sorry, I didn't give you that slide, but there are 10 and counting. The Gospels are correct. So here are pictures. Now, that's up in the Golan Heights. That synagogue was destroyed by the Romans during the war, 66 to 70. That synagogue was destroyed in 67. And uh, take a look at it. You can see the uh, outline. The seating would be like these steps around the perimeter wall, inside the perimeter wall, looking in. So in other words, the synagogue does, would not look like this. And of course, the building would be much smaller, and it would be step bench seating inside the perimeter wall so people look in. And you have pillars at the corners and usually extra pillars in the middle. And it, it's a very strange configuration. Why would you sit looking in, not at the speaker, but at the middle of the floor? And you might even have a pillar blocking your view somewhat. That's an interesting question. Well, all the synagogues in this early period of time are like that. So let's look at the next example. This is the Herodium. And why this is important to me is it shows the commitment to having a certain kind of pattern. Do you realize that that used to be a dining hall when Herod built the Herodium? When the rebels revolted in 66, they seized control of the Herodium. They occupied it. And what did they do? They went into the dining hall which had beautiful mosaics and pictures that they found offensive. They plastered over them, and they put in the bench seating around the, 
the wall, the outside wall, seating, looking in, and put up pillars that served no purpose at all. The pillars don't hold up anything. Be like in this church, just putting a post right here. Doesn't even reach the ceiling. That's because that's the way it looks. That's the way a synagogue is supposed to look. Look at the next example. This is on Masada, another Herodian palace that's near the Dead Sea. And this was just a guard room. And when the rebels seize control of it, they take this room, put in the bench seating. That's just one corner. It's all the way around. And they put in a pillar in the middle of the room that doesn't hold up anything. <coughs> Same idea. Why? Because that's what a synagogue looks like. If Christians grabbed a building and said, let's make it a church, you know they'd be put a cross up on top, maybe some kind of a steeple or something. So it looks like a church. Well, that's what they're doing. Well, all of this is pre-70. Okay, so we have 10 synagogues pre-70. So when the gospels say Jesus taught in their synagogues, the gospels have it right. And we've only found a fraction of the synagogues that existed a long time ago. If we were to dig up all of Israel, we'd probably find dozens more. I want to end, though, uh, this, this section with Magdala. That's where Mary Magdalene came from. That's a synagogue found in 2009, and it's still being excavated even to this day. It's on display. You, if you go to Israel, you can see it. Magdala is near Capernaum. It's in the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. But see that in the middle? That decorated stone, that's exactly where they found it. That's what I think the people were looking at. When they're sitting around in a squarish circle looking inward into the middle, they're looking at that. And that decorated stone is decorated to look like the temple in Jerusalem. So that's what they're thinking about. And we now realize, oh, the, the Galileans weren't worldly. They weren't cosmopolitan. They weren't liberal. They were conservative Jews who took their faith seriously. When they went south to Jerusalem for the festivals like Passover, they were critical of the ruling priests. They were the liberals playing footsie with the Romans, compromising on the faith, doing stuff that the Galileans thought was, worth, was worldly and compromised the faith. So the Galileans were seen as religious fanatics. And we realize, oh, I see. Even in their synagogues up north in Galilee, they're thinking about that temple. That's what they're looking at when they hear Scripture read and sermons preached and so on. Jesus would have preached in a setting like that. He might have preached in this very synagogue. Mary Magdalene may have even attended it. It was built in the 20s and destroyed in the year 66 or 67 by Titus the general, the son of Vespasian, who later became the Roman emperor. Of course, this is a synagogue everybody has seen who's gone to Israel. They'll go to Capernaum, which is next door to Magdala. And they see this beautiful limestone, partly reconstructed, beautiful limestone synagogue resting on an old volcanic black basalt foundation. Well, that synagogue you're looking at in the picture, it's fourth century, so Jesus didn't see it. But what he saw is what we can see now underneath. <clears throat> and if you look carefully, look at the bottom, you see the bottom row of limestone. Notice, everyone, how when you go from left to right, the limestone gets thicker and thicker as you move to the right. Now, if I were to have another picture and show you all the way to the right, to the right corner where it ends, it's almost a meter thick, almost a yard thick. So it goes from eight inches to 30 some inches. That foundation obviously is not level. That would never pass building codes today. Can you imagine that? The building inspector comes out, oh, you poured your foundation. Yeah. And for, it's not level. Well, is it, how much is it off? Oh, th uh, three feet. You'd have the leaning tower of Pisa right there if you built, you know, say, he'd say, tear it up. You got to do it again. Get it level this time. So why did they do that? Look at all the trouble the stonemason went through to get the limestone. Each each block had to be a little thicker, slowly, slowly move as he went to the right so that it would be level. The first tier of limestone would be level, and then he built it on top of that. Why? It's because of a theological conviction you build on the foundation. Paul himself says that in Romans, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, where he says that he is built on this foundation, the foundation of Christ, and there is no other foundation. Everybody has to build 
on it. And he goes on to say, be careful how you build on it because the quality of your work will be tested by fire. And then we have an inscription found in the rubble of Jerusalem after the Romans destroyed it. Here it is, this inscription written in Greek. Thanks the family of Theodotus, a ruler of the synagogue who happens to be also a priest, because they donated money that allowed them to build a guest room and a study room and add it to the synagogue. We're talking about a building, folks. And this inscription goes all the way back to the beginning of the first century A.D. So were there synagogues in Galilee? Yes, there were even synagogues in Jerusalem itself. The Gospels are accurate. And you can, this book by Rachel Hock Lely, I've been in her, her living room. She's uh, in her 80s now and retired. But it's called uh, Ancient Synagogues. It came out in 2013. So I asked her point blank, Rachel, were there synagogues at the time of Jesus? She said, of course there were. There were lots of them. And she's the one that has upped the count all the way to 10 and still going up. How about the fishing boats? Were there fishing boats big enough to accommodate Jesus and his 12 disciples? They say he was in the boat all the time, crossing the north end of the sea, going from Capernaum to Bethsaida and, and all the way over to the western shore. <coughs> well, were there? Well, we had found a boat. Apparently it was. In 1984, the water level was down. Somebody saw the outline of the boat sticking above the water. There was no oxygen in this part of the water in the mud, and therefore the microbes that would otherwise live there and eat the wood up, the microbes weren't there. And so the boat survived, and it took a tremendous amount of engineering and cleverness to recover it. And we have it now. That's Jerome Hall. He's on the faculty of the University of, Southern, uh, of the University of California at San Diego. He is the curator. He's talking about how long the boat is, how wide it is. We also know how big men and women were back then. Men were five foot five, five foot six, weighed 140 pounds. Women were 4'11", 4'. 10, weighed 90, 95 pounds. Obviously, people were a little bit smaller then. And he said there'd be no problem, six disciples on each side and Jesus at the stern, exactly the way it's described in Mark chapter 4, where Jesus stills the storm. See, I think we got the idea that boats are small because of this mosaic. It looks small. looks like you could have four or five, six guys in that boat, no more. But that is only a picture now, here's the really interesting topic. What about the evidence for Jesus as a healer and exorcist? We actually have hard evidence for that in terms of magic papyri, magic bowls, and the Jesus cup. So let's take a look. Let's start with the text of Scripture itself. In Mark chapter 9, the disciple John said, Master, we saw somebody <clears throat> who was casting out demons in your name. He was not following us. Okay, so he didn't like that. It was like, it, from his point of view, it was an illicit use of Jesus' name. Jesus surprises everybody, says, don't forbid him. He who is not uh, against us is for us. Anyway, what I find interesting is this is unusual. It's unprecedented. Usually someone like Solomon needs centuries to gain a reputation to, to develop a legend where people say, oh, this guy was great, lived a long time ago. Jesus is in his ministry, a ministry that might at this point only be a year old. And professional exorcists are using his name in their work. That is very significant. That would suggest, I mean, they're not a follower, right? They don't believe in Jesus exactly. They observe what he does and they realize pragmatically it works don't know how, but it works. And so they invoke his name. Look at Acts chapter 8. Simon Magus, a professional magician, he sees what the apostles are doing in the name of Jesus. People receive the Holy Spirit. People are healed. And what does he do? He says, can I buy some of that? He wants to buy part of the Holy Spirit. Of course, he gets rebuked by Peter for doing that. That is an interesting outside testimony. This other one I really like is um, in Acts 19, the sons of Sceva, seven sons, sons of a Jewish priest, professional exorcists, have incantation, will travel. That's what it says on their business card. 
So there they are in Ephesus, and they, over, they, they see this, who's this Paul guy? In the name of Jesus, he heals people. He casts out evil spirits. They're professionals. So they get this real tough case, this really wild, crazy guy. Nobody's been able to help him. And they say, we exercise you. And you can see the text. I've given it to you. Exorcizo, we exercise you in the name of this Jesus whom Paul preaches. And it gets really eerie. If Stephen King were here, I'd invite him to do it for us. He'd probably tell us, oh yeah, suddenly this guy's eyes, they glow red. His head, you know, does a 360. His voice alters and he says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? And these guys are thinking, um, uh, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> Where's the door? And of course he overpowers them, beats them all up. They flee wounded and naked. And the point of that is, is they would have been wearing robes with special protective sim symbols, phylacteries that suppose oh, they didn't do them any good. These things got just ripped apart and away they ran, injured. And the story goes on to say everybody in Ephesus respected the name of Jesus, that man, this is something else. And they took their magic books and just threw them in the street and burned them. Well, this is quite significant. This tells us that people who aren't Christians recognize the power of the name of Jesus. And we have archaeological evidence for that in three forms, these papyri bulls and the cup. So here we are. That's a magical papyrus. There are thousands of these things. We've dug up. They survive mostly in Egypt where it's dry and this stuff survives. You have a cartoon picture of somebody. It's usually the demon you want to uh, destroy or tie up, bind so he can't hurt you. And then you have text with the incantation. That's what that is. Here's my favorite. It's called uh, a charm by Pibicus against evil spirits. That's what it looks like. It has 80 lines. Jesus is mentioned by name on the, in the left column in line 20. So here's what it says. I adjure you by the God of the Hebrews, Jesus. This is extraordinary. I adjure you by the seal that Solomon placed on the tongue of Jeremiah. I adjure you, the one who receives this conjuration, not to eat pork. And every spirit and demon, whatever sort it may be, will be subject to you. Keep yourself pure, for this charm is Hebraic and is preserved among pure men. So this Egyptian charm borrows from Jewish tradition. It's even kosher, you might say. And at some point, it upgrades its potency by invoking the name of Jesus, identified as the God of the Hebrews. That's the actual text. So this is no theory. There it is, the actual text, third century, but we think it was originally composed in the first century, and Jesus is seen as the supreme deity that will protect you from evil spirits. Where does this come from? From reading the Bible? No. Reading the Gospels? No. In observing actual healing take place in the name of Jesus. And it very much impressed pagans. There were bowls that were written in the 5th, 6th, 7th century. You see the picture in the middle and the circular writing in Aramaic. One bowl actually refers to Jesus in the name of I am that I am. Yahweh Tsevot, the Lord of hosts. And in the name of Jesus, Yeshu, right there, who conquered the height and depth by his cross. Or this other bowl. These two bowls are in the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem. Bowl number 155. May she be healed from the spirit of the belly in the name of Yahweh, holy God, holy God, holy God, brave God, brave God, in the name of Zokasun, Zokasun, Ast, Christ, Christos, transliterated, the Greek word for Christ, anointed one, same as Messiah. So what was happening in the Jewish world, which this is, or in the pagan world, like the Pibicus Egyptian charm, there was the widespread belief, we don't know who exactly this Jesus is, but he is powerful. So we actually have archaeological evidence of magical papyri and bowls and cups. That's Shimon Gibson. He's the archaeologist I work with at Mount Zion in Jerusalem. I've been a volunteer digger at his site 
a few seasons, and we find a cup there, and it has magical writing on it. So it's a magic cup of some sort. But this cup, the next cup I want to show you, actually refers to Christ. On this side of it, one of the handles is broken off. On that side, it says, through Christ. Now I'm going to flip to the next side, and it goes on to say, Hogoistais, the enchanter. So this is a cup that originally was made about 100 B.C., and sometime in 50 A.D. or a little later, somebody writes through Christ on it to upgrade it. You know, it, its, it's uh, operating system was 2.0. Now it's 5.0 because it says, through Christ the enchanter speaks. We should assume the verb. Has more power. It's fascinating. This, is, again, this was found in Egypt, Alexandria, in 20 feet of water. And they had one of these vacuums that was sucking up the sand, and it sucked it up. And there it was, this old magician's cup. And some pagan realized he could make his magic cup more powerful by adding a reference to Christ. Okay, here's a uh, conclusion. I'll wrap this up, and if any of you want to chat or you know talk to me at the books outside, I have some books out there and flash drives. If you want this PowerPoint, it's available and so on. So in conclusion, here's more evidence for the fact that Jesus was seen as a powerful healer. It wasn't just the pagans who were invoking his name. Christians obviously prayed in the name of Jesus, but even Jewish people who weren't otherwise Christians. And it, the problem got so bad that the rabbis, leaders in, uh, in the synagogue, passed a rule saying you should not be healed in the name of Jesus. Better to die and not break the rules of the rabbis than to be healed in the name of Jesus and live. Now, that's a pretty draconian rule. Okay, and this is found in something that's called Tosefta Tractate Hulin. You see it up there, 222. And here it actually is. You can see it. That's the Hebrew text, and in uh, blue is where it refers to Jesus. In the name of Yeshu, in the name of Jesus, son of Pantera. The Pantera reference is an insult uh, having to do with questions about Jesus' virginal birth, which, of course, was rejected. So anyway, here's actual evidence in various circles, pagan and Jewish, some of it archaeological evidence that Jesus was recognized widely as a healer. So we've looked at four basic topics, the world Jesus grew up in, uh, the whole question of synagogues, boat, and even tradition supporting healing and exorcism and archaeology sheds light on all of that. Let me put it to you this way as a final word of conclusion. When historians look at old sources like the Gospels or any other writing from antiquity, they look for something that's called verisimilitude. Verisimilitude, just a fat, fancy Latin word that means it is similar to the truth. The source exhibits or reflects reality, the way things really were. Other sources, archaeology, topography, geography, whatever it is, these sources all say this writing is either true or it is not. The Gospels exhibit verisimilitude. That's why archaeologists use them. Archaeologists, as I said, they got a lot of skin in the game. You're not going to be using a source that leads you nowhere that talks about imaginary villages and imaginary hills and streams, you use sources that get it right, that guide you to the right spot and helps you understand what you dig up. The Gospels exhibit verisimilitude. That's why the archaeologists use them. The Gospels talk about real people, real places, real events. Some of you perhaps heard a few months ago the pilot ring was found. It's a seal ring that Pontius Pilate would wear and stamp stuff, and it, and it says belonging to Pilate. We have found the stone that has Pontius <clears throat> Pilate's name on it that was found in 1961. 
Why do I mention that? Do you realize there were people up until 1961 who argued that Pilate didn't even exist, that he was a fictional character that the Gospels invented in their story about Jesus' crucifixion? How ridiculous. And of course, now we have not one but two pieces of archaeological evidence relating to Pilate. He most certainly did exist. He was the governor. We now have a bone box where the bones of Caiaphas were gathered. <clears throat> the bone box actually has his name right on it. So the two principal people, the Jewish high priest and the Roman governor, the two principal people that sent Jesus to the cross, we actually have archaeological evidence for both of them. And so as we continue to dig, and by the way, we think we have excavated approximately 5% of the biblical world. That's just 5%. One place in 20, 19 more to go, and we've been at it for over 100 years. So it's a big job. But as we continue to dig things up again and again and again, it shows there really was a King David. There really was a kingdom. Jesus really did do this. He really did that. And, and the Gospels get it right. You need to understand that Archaeology is a friend. The toughest question I've ever had put to me on this topic was, Professor Evans, can you think of one example where archaeology has shown that the Gospels got it wrong? Uh, that stumps me. Uh, no. Sorry, not yet. I haven't found that. But what we keep finding is stuff that shows that the Gospels get it right. So archaeology is a big friend. Don't be afraid of it. Volunteer for a dig sometime. And I want to close by thanking my three advisors. There they are, Ryder, Abel, and Jackson. <clears throat> they're, they're triplets. Uh, I mention this only because just a few days ago it was their third birthday. So thank you very much. <laughs>